I don't think that you go about your business and they sort of follow you around, dabbling. Yeah. No, but it's almost like they are having a bit of a laugh with you. Right, well I'll just like to say now that they don't. Anyone who's going in for an operation on their head, uh, do not ever listen to anything but Carl wh says. Wh why have you got to be awake? Because you'll be bored anyway, you'll be sat there. They'll well, be they, they give you out. a telephone directory look and they say, look how many Macs are in there. We've, that's the Scottish telephone directory. And you know, time flies when you're counting <laughs> that sort of thing. <laughs> No, but do you know, like, when you- when What are you- what are you telling me? What are you asking me? I'm just saying how weird it is. It's weird, isn't it? It's like, do you know when you go for a haircut, <laughs> right? It's a bit embarrassing. Well, I don't anymore, but when you go for a haircut, it used to be a When bit you go for a haircut? It used to be a bit embarrassing when, like, they'd wet your hair and they'd make you have that sort of Hitler cut because your hair's <laughs> wet and I used to hate it and I think, do you have to do that? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You know it's what I similar, mean, it's you? very similar to uh, open, um, skull no, surgery. No, what I'm saying yeah. is, it's almost like barbers like to do that to make you look daft and feel daft for a bit and there's women coming in and out and you're sat there with a daft haircut. Yeah. And this is what that reminds me of. Do you think that- do you think they do it in a shop window, this brain operation? I'm just saying, it's a bit weird. Do you think, why are we doing it in John Lewis's? <laughs> just so more people I love the idea that that's what doctors are doing. <laughs> Let's <laughs> make this guy look a bit stupid. Yeah. Open his brain look case. Look at the twatty look from his brain <laughs> out <laughs> of his head. Take a Polaroid. Reg, take, yeah, a Polaroid. take a Polaroid. Look at him, look, look, <laughs> look, 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 look at his face. Right, do, look, right, clock his face when I give him the mirror. Get this on camera. Put Carl this fake nose and glasses Sorry, on. Sorry, is that- did you teach me something then? Was well, that educational? I thought you that your brain- your brain case can be open with your awake. And you just sat there sort of letting him get on with it. Brilliant, I've learned that. I'll never forget that. Right, go on, anything else? You'll love- let's play a song cause the next one is amazing. <laughs> what, even more amazing than that? Yeah. <laughs> play a song? Yeah, bit of Bowie? No email still, by the way. No, I don't think it's working. It's not working today, Lady so Stardust. We'll, gonna, we'll have to do a phone in for Rockbusters. Off Blimey. the Ziggy Stardust album. Alright. <laughs> bit of David Bowie. Uh, when's that ever at anyone, Steve? Never. Lady Stardust off Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars on XFM 104.9. I'm Ricky Gervais, Steve Merchant. Carl Pilkington is in the middle of educating me. Colon, then. Educate me. Right, so, um... I've learnt that you can, you know, fiddle around with your brain when awake. That's brilliant. I've never been a fan of Doctors, though, so this was a good one for me to, yeah. to look up, cos... Yeah. Did I tell you the time... <laughs> When, uh, the doctor said, uh, I was gonna die. Alright, keep talking. Right, ages ago, um, must have been about fifteen, right? And, uh, at lunchtime there was this- we used to have a choice of stuff to do at lunchtime, right? We used to have, um, like a- like a burger place that had an arcade machine in it, right? So we used to go there and play on that and have a burger. Or, there was this- my mum worked at- and uh, did great cakes and stuff, right? So, um, she used to like bring some home and that, but she couldn't always bring them home every night because, you know, they, they'd cost money and she used to get them for free. And they used to say they'd rather chuck them away than give them to the staff because there's a chance that the cream might be off. Right. Right, so they used to chuck them round the back. So I used to go round the back with my mate and eat a load. Brilliant. Scavenging, yep. eating out of bins. <laughs> no, it was really- it wasn't out of bins, they were still in trays, but they just stacked them up near the bins, right? So this got out, I mean it used to be a chocker. Uh, once the school found out, everybody used to go there and it'd be like, well, have a cake. <laughs> the headmaster crawling <laughs> yeah. fighting the kids off. <laughs> right, so I'd have like, uh, you know, you'd just eat, I don't know, six jam donuts or something, and then you'd spend your dinner money on the arcade machine. Brilliant. Right? So it was a good- good afternoon, really, right? So, you'd do that. And this one day, I must have had six or seven uh, jam donuts, a few Congress tarts. Uh, <laughs> What's a Congress tart? Just, I love them. It's me. I can't get them in London, right? So I'd have some of them. <laughs> uh, uh, if anyone can get a Congress tart um, for Carl in London, please let him know. So anyway, this day that that was just a normal day. Do you know what I mean? You'd once yeah. twice a week, you'd have a load of cake <laughs> in your life. Yeah, yeah a so normal anyway. day in your life. Uh, were, were the frog boys there with the with the? <laughs> Webbed hands and the big heads, so, and the horse in the city. Uh, yeah. But the day after, one of these days, I had really bad cramp in my belly. Okay. Right? I was like in agony, could yeah. hardly walk. So I said to my mum, oh. <laughs> "You could hardly stagger to the free cakes." <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was in absolute agony. I said, "I think I don't like doctors, but you'll have to get a doctor in because I don't know what it is. I can't walk." She gets the doctor around. Uh, I won't say his name, but he said, uh, "He said, well, doesn't look like he's got long left." Blimey. 
So I was a bit like, hang on a minute, I've only had a few cream donuts. Yeah. My mum was panicking. Sure. He went, my dad came in from work, she said, oh, something's really bad with Carl, I think it's serious, it's, you know, the doctors only ain't got long left. So he said, what, he said that and just left? So she said, yeah. He said, I'll have to call him then. So he called him up, said, uh, what's all this about, you know, Carl hasn't got long left, how long's he got? So he goes, oh, I was only messing. It's just got, it's just had some bad cream. Can you believe that? <laughs> well, the thing is, <laughs> I like the fact your mum didn't ask any questions. I know. <laughs> she didn't yeah, go into detail. Now, now, well, I, can I, you I, explain I, more, Doctor? No, I got a shoe off. I, no, but uh, she doesn't. She I, doesn't no, like no, no, you know, I don't want to diss you or your family, but I imagine if I was there, I'd have known the Doctor was joking. <laughs> yes. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I sound very arrogant there, but I imagine he went, what's he been doing? I had about six cream grounds. Oh, right. Oh, wow. Uh, he hasn't got long to live then. I'll see you later. <laughs> yeah. That's what I think the doctor did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just love the idea your mum just let him go. Yeah. Terrified, thinking, yeah. well, I'm not gonna probe him. He's, he's, that's it then. Dad comes in. Hi, honey, I'm home. Anything happened? Uh, the doctor said Carl's gonna die and then left. <laughs> did he? I'll call him. <laughs> but anyway, that's why, uh, these sort of things fascinate me. So, right. we'll move on to this next one, right, which is brilliant. Go Dead on. short story, so, right, uh, old woman, about seventy years old, yeah. uh, she's normally fit and healthy and stuff, nothing wrong with her, she's having a good life, and, uh, one day, she goes for a check to the doctors, yeah. just to check herself out, cause she's yeah. getting on a bit, yeah. uh, says, take your clothes off and that, so she does, and, uh, checks her out, says, yeah, you're looking good, you're looking good, uh, turn round, uh, he said, oh god, he says, you got a, a tumour on your buttock, right? So she goes, oh, what, can you do anything to sort it out? So they go, yeah, 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 we could book you in for an operation, it's best if we remove this. Books are in for an operation, operation day comes, strip her down and that, they're all stood round, the doctors, start to operate, it only turns out it's a pork chop that she sat on five years earlier and it had stuck to her buttock. Right, Carl. <laughs> I right, can forward you. I'm, I'm not, honest. Right. I'm, no, I'm, listen. Okay, no, I'm, serious. Me, right, okay, Carl. I'm telling you now. I'm leaving. I'm no. never. I'm never doing this show again. No, I'm serious. Honestly, You're talking. I, I, I've never had any such. You are play a record. Play a record. <laughs> I can not believe it. it. What do you mean you can't believe? It? Stop, stop the record. Stop the record. Stop the record. Right. Okay. Right. What do you mean you couldn't believe it? No. When I read it, I said I've got to tell Richard. This woman I had a pork chop stuck to her ass for five years. You mental case. <laughs> of course she didn't. Syntax, Pry, XFM 104.9, Ricky Gervais, Steve Merchant, Carl Pilkington, right, get off. Right, what you got next? Right, well, uh, running a bit late with this, but it's time for, uh, do we need them? We're, we're looking into what I'm really worried about this, cos everyone's getting that last clue wrong. I reckon it's so rubbish that even your mental fans can't work it out. Yeah, it's, it's a tough one, but... Give that final Rockbusters clue again. The Jamaican fella, uh, had to have some aspirin. Why is that? Why, why did he have to do it? FD. No, hold on, that's changed. <laughs> well, you can, I mean, it doesn't matter, the story's Oh, it doesn't still matter. There. That's the point of a cryptic clue, isn't it? Oh, do, do. What have you got now? Right, so we, we're looking into animals that we get rid of. I've spoken to someone about snails, I've spoke to someone about jellyfish, and that, and, uh, looking at cockroaches today. Right, now who's the expert? Um, it's a woman called, uh, Jessica Marshall. Right. Does she know that you're going to play this on the radio? Well, I called up, right, in the week and said, can I talk to someone about Just cockroaches? And she was like, is that Carl? She knows who you are. Yeah. Right, so she already knows maybe your angle, your approach. Yeah, she was and, up uh, for she, it. And she's an expert, she's just not, not just some random person. No, she works in a museum, where, a good museum, I said I'd give it a plug. It's a one near Knightsbridge, it's got dinosaurs and that in it, it's worth seeing. Well, and that's Mystery Museum? Yeah. So, uh... <laughs> not sure. <laughs> <laughs> He's not sure. <laughs> this is Go what on. happened. Now, what I'll do, I'll tell you as much as, as I know, and then you can fill me in if I'm right or wrong, and then at the end of it we'll get to the bottom of whether we need them or not. Okay. Alright, so, uh, first of all, uh, the first thing that, that, I, that I found out is that, um, that they have eight, 18 knees. Uh, that's not exactly possible. They're insects, so they have six legs. 
Yeah. And the knee is usually the junction between femur and tibia. That's sort of classic human knee and every other animal knee. So with six legs, you can only have six knees. Uh, could somebody sort of got mistaken for seeing one that was a bit double-jointed? Cover I, I think you're grasping at straws or something. All right, well, uh, well, we might have to come back to that one then. Okay. Um, they can hold the breath for 40 minutes. Well, they don't do that because they don't breathe in the same way as us. They breathe through little spiracles, holes down the, the side of the body, so... Um, no, if they're not a very apt simile because the, the method of breathing is so different. What do you mean? Because insects have a, a totally different system. They don't have lungs in the way that we do and just breathing through one part of the body. They're, they're actually breathing through every segment of the body all of the time. So even though they've got their mouth shut, they might... Be able no, to slide. It's nothing to do with breathing. So Only just feeding. So you see, maybe that's where someone's gone wrong. Someone's got hold of one and sort of taped its mouth up or something, and it was. got bored after forty <laughs> minutes and said, "Well, we'll call it right." That's a unkind thing to do to an insect, even to a cockroach. Yeah, but it's all. You can't do that. Yeah, but. No, pretty unkind thing to do anything to anything, even a cockroach. Something else I found out. Yeah. They can live for a week without an head. Well, that's true if they don't bleep to death in the process. But the weird thing is, when I told you that they had 18 knees, you seemed a bit sort of, like, don't don't talk ridiculous. But yeah. then we're talking about an animal that can live without an head. Ah. Uh, so, so there's a little bit of truth in that one, yeah? Yes. Why, when it was invented, has it got that facility? Say if someone said to humans, we could do that with humans, and, you know, if you lose your head in some accident, it gives you a bit of time to sort of go back to your, to your family and maybe write them, write them a note. You won't be able to have a chat, but write them a note saying it was my own fault and uh, it was nice knowing you. Oh, well, that I would be a useful facility, I agree. But cockroaches are great survivors. I mean, they've been around for over 300 million years. They're one of the most primitive insects. All right. Well, I've also... Um, is it true that they do a lot of resting? Apparently they can sort of rest for 75% of the time. Rest? Yeah, they just, just sit about doing nothing. It's probably true of a, a vast proportion of, of the world's fauna. Well, I mean, not, maybe maybe the 25% uh, that they are working, they're really giving it some, so it might make up... they're searching out food and, um, yeah, they can slow down considerably. You can chill insects in the fridge and they'll become very, very quiet. You might think they're dead. Yeah, but, but I'm sure, you know, if, if we were sat in a fridge, you know, we'd go a bit quiet, wouldn't we, you know? Well, uh, you might not know much about it, of course. Yeah, but... Not quite reading the, the right sources. Well, I've been using the internet. I'm sure there are many useful sources that you could find there, but some of those seem to have been a little um, misleading to you. You don't agree with, with a lot of what I've told you there? No. So, cockroaches, can we get rid of them? No. So we're keeping them then? I would say so, yes. <laughs> I think we should get her on more often because she sounds like she'd be a bit of an ally, really. Because she knew immediately that you were talking nonsense. She even said, I think you should be more concerned about your sources, which I've been trying to tell you for a year, right? The fact, I mean, I mean, 18 knees, where did you get that from? It was, uh, it was on the uh, internet. Uh, they can hold their breath for 40 minutes. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what, I don't know what you read and take on. Mad world, don't it? <laughs> right, the cure, obviously. Yeah. Some. Right, Carl's been taking phone calls for these clues. <laughs> right, and so everyone's been saying the same thing for the last one. He's been going no, no, and I'm worried. I'm always worried. FD, I just overheard him on the call. They're going. <gasps> What have I been saying? Oh, no, it's FP. <laughs> Dickhead. Right, give me the clues out. It's a roller. Right, tell people that's- we're really sorry to anyone who would have got that right. Okay, right, do the clues quickly. Tell them it'd be a rollover, so we have to do three new ones. Do you not write these you down, You such a t I don't- I don't write the answers down in case Ricky looks over the thing and sees the answer. Why would I cheat? I'd rather you do something right with your life!
Right, well the clues were I've got three other jumpers like this one. Yeah. That was FT. Yeah. They got that. Four tops. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Good, well done. That bunch of people can't make up their minds if they'd want to sit in the sun or not. That was C. They were getting that. That was charlatans. Charlatan. Right, a bunch of them. Charlatans, right? What? What? what do they <laughs> what's, Char what's Charlie? No. No, it's like, shall I go out? Shall we? Charla. Charlatans. They got it, right? <laughs> Where I went wrong with this one, uh, the Jamaican fella, he had to have some aspirin, why? Um, it's my fault, you know, I'm not, I'm not cutting, there's no point passing the book or anything. Um, I said FD, a lot of people were saying, uh, Fred Durst, like, f four Ed Ertz, which is a good <laughs> one. Yeah, which would have been as good as any of yours. But I made an error, so we'll roll it over. No, 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 no. no. What is the answer? We'll roll, we'll roll well, what the was the answer? Over. Jamaican fellow what? Add some aspirin, why do that? What's the, what's the thing? FP. FP, it was Frida Payne. <laughs> Frida Payne? Frida Payne. Frida Payne. Frida Payne. That's awful. Carl, Frida You've got to write these down next yeah, week. This I is I'm, right. I'm sorry, you are, right. Uh, you're I, the producer. I, think, I know, I know, but I've had a busy week, haven't I? That's just doing not stuff an excuse. That isn't an excuse. Our excuse is we don't. We have. We don't care. <laughs> yeah. You, you do put care. the work in and you, then make a mistake. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I mean, it's better not to try than try your hardest and be rubbish. <laughs> do you see what the point? We've got. We don't care. But you've got standards. Yeah. And, and you're, you're not meeting them. You're for- think of that! You're not even reaching your standards. <laughs> God! <laughs> right, uh, well that's that I guess. Well, the prizes will be, uh, giving those away next Bollocks week. again. Uh, Just and, completely- uh, Song for the ladies to end the show with. It's from Nick Cave's new album, Nocturama. This is a track called He Wants You, back next week. Remember, free to pain. <laughs> Series of the third kind. Welcome to Theories of the Third Kind. My name is Aaron, and I'm one of your cult leaders. I mean, hosts today. There are two other hosts that are joining me today. Of course, the Asian sensation, Daniel Sun. Oh, hello. And our new alien hybrid, Anna. Hi, everyone. So before we start today's episode, I just want to say, like always, we don't run any ads or take any money from any corporations. So if you'd like to help us out, then there's a few ways that you can do that. One way is to sign up for our new Patreon. It's only $5 a month, and we give you an extra episode a week. We love talking to you guys on there, so you're going to get extra interactions with us as well. and. When you're a Patreon member, your suggestions for topics go to the top of our list. So our Patreon this week is going to be a Thoughts and Theories episode. But on there, we also have Dreams, Clinton Body Count, we have Charles Manson. So get over there, sign up, like I said, $5, and you're going to get a nice little binge-worthy section. Another way to support the show, merchandise. If you go to our website, theoriesofthethirdkind.com, and click on the shop buttons, there you can see all the merchandise we have for sale. We have t-shirts, hats, and some other fascinating items. I just want to say that all the money we get from this, from our Patreon and merchandise sales, it goes back to bettering the show. Also, I know things are a little tough out there right now with the virus getting people out of jobs. So if you can't afford a shirt or a Patreon membership, but you want to help us out, you can always leave us a written review on iTunes. It helps us out tremendously. But no pressure. No pressure. If you don't want to leave one, that's totally fine. We just want you guys, girls, aliens, reptilians, Bigfoot, Sasquatches, Chupacabras, Ghosts, Illuminati members, underground lizard people, whoever or whatever you are, to enjoy the show. Also, if any of you would like to reach out to us, you can shoot us a message on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, or you can go to our website, theoriesofthethirdkind.com. Click on the contact button, and there you will find our email addresses. Also, on our site, you can click on the voicemail button and leave us a voicemail anonymously with your phone and we will play it on the show each week. 
So today's episode is Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. Let's start off with talking about the timeline of this event to better understand what happened with this flight. Then we'll dive into the search efforts, then the theories surrounding it, and last, of course, we will wrap it all up with our personal thoughts and theories. So Dan, can you start us off with the timeline? This all starts off on March 8th of 2014. Asia Airlines had a scheduled normal flight leaving Kuala Lumpur you know, International Airport at 12.35 a.m. that had a final destination of Beijing International Airport. The plane for this flight was a huge Boeing 777. So at 12.35, all the 239 passengers boarded the plane, and everything was looking good. Nothing was out of the ordinary. The flight took off at its scheduled time of 12.41, and all tracking systems on the plane were working. So at 1.19 a.m., an unidentified male voice on flight MH370 made a voice check-in with air traffic controllers. The male voice told the air traffic controllers that they were leaving Malaysian airspace and entering Vietnamese airspace. Then the last words are, good night, Malaysian 370. Now, we have a clip of that, and we're going to play that right now. Uh, good night, Malaysian uh, 370. All right, so that's what was said. And this phrase was typical. I mean, it was used by the pilots when executing what is called a uh, handover. So all airplanes are tracked by air traffic control towers, right? Well, certain areas are tracked by certain air traffic control towers. Um, a handshake is when one air traffic control tower hands off the tracking of a plane to another tower. So it's, it's, it's a way for them to keep track of like multiple planes. Imagine it as like um, sections, right? Checkpoints. Yeah, checkpoints, exactly. And whenever one plane goes to a different area, then the air traffic controller does what's called a handshake, and then the other tower takes it over. So this Malaysian airspace was handing the tracking over to the Vietnamese airspace, if all that makes sense. Before we get into what happens next to the plane, we have to quickly go over what a transponder is. Every plane has a transponder. It sends electronic messages from the plane to radar systems about the flight number, altitude, speed, and heading. This information is enormously useful to air traffic controllers. They're looking at screens and tracking planes. These planes are emitting identifying information on that screen because of these transponders. Okay, now that we understand that, let's get back to the timeline. At 1.21 in the morning, the plane's transponder stops communicating with the air traffic controller. The plane goes dark. No one can track it. It just drops off the radar. The transponder didn't break. It had multiple backups. So the fact that those didn't kick on means that they manually shut them off. And just a little FYI, I looked into how it could be turned off. And after doing some digging, it's, it's pretty simple. You just turn a switch in the cockpit. That's how simple it is. All right. Yeah. It's like a lavatory light on and off. Yep. So also immediately after the plane's transponder gets turned off, the plane does a complete turnaround and starts heading back the other way that it came. This was found out because of the Malaysian Air Force was tracking the plane. So around 2.15 a.m., the Malaysian Air Force military radar tracked the plane as it passed over the small island of Palau Parat in the Strait of Malacca. At this point, the plane was hundreds of miles off course. In fact, it was on the other side of the Malay Peninsula. This was the last time any civilian or military radar is known to have tracked this aircraft. So then at 2.40 in the morning, Malaysian air traffic controllers told Malaysia Airlines that MH370 was missing from radar. I'd say that was a little late. Uh, but then... At 3.45, Malaysia Airlines issued what is called a code red alert. That means a plane has gone missing from the radar. When the code red is declared, then it requires immediate deployment of emergency response plans. It said it took about an hour to issue the alert because it was trying to locate the plane and confirm that it was missing. To verify, it used various measurements, including sending messages to the plane and guess what? Awaiting a response. As simple as that. 
At 8.19 a.m., MH370 did what is called an electronic handshake with a satellite above the Indian Ocean. After that, the plane simply vanished into thin air. So, I mean, it had already vanished off other radars, but the last known tracking of it was that satellite at 8.19 a.m., and then it completely vanished. Now that we've discussed the timeline of it, why don't we get into the search efforts? Daniel-san, can you tell us briefly about the search efforts of MH370? Yeah, I can definitely tell you about the search. So when the MH370 went missing, rescue teams went out 12 hours after the disappearance from radar, fearing it may have crashed around the South China Sea, but they couldn't find any sign of the plane or its wreckage. So both ship and air search teams spent four days checking the ocean from Malaysia to Vietnam. Those four days was actually a waste of time. Why was it a waste, you ask? While it was because Malaysia waited until then to tell the teams they had given rescuers the wrong direction to search in. <laughs> oh <my> God, <laughs> what a bunch of you know idiots! They were ba- like bantering back and forth. We gotta tell them. We gotta tell them. No, we can't be wrong. We can't tell them that we made a mistake. But let's just let it keep going. And the- <laughs> yeah, that's that's exactly what happened. They would soon realize that when the plane disappeared from the radar, it took a hundred eighty degree turn and started to fly back towards Malaysia and Vietnam. The plane flew along the border. It would be going in and out of both countries' airspace and try not to raise any attention to the plane. The search and rescue operation was the largest and most expensive in aviation history to date. So they spent a lot of money trying to find this plane. Mm. Yeah, they did. Or trying to hide it. Mm-hmm. Which I think they did. Mm-hmm. So we got a couple pictures here showing the flight path and pretty much the area that they searched in looking for this plane. And from now on, we're going to be posting these pictures that we talk about. We're going to be posting them on our site under that episode. So if we talk about any pictures or anything, instead of going to social medias and looking at them, you can go to our site, theoriesofthethirdkind.com, click on that episode. And when you click on that episode and you scroll down a little bit, it will show you all the pictures. So you can just go straight there and look at them. All right, let's jump over to possible sightings. So, Anna, do you want to get into that for us? Yeah, I'll help us dive into this a little bit. We do have a couple different reports of sightings. Vietnam said its rescue planes had spotted two large oil slicks. Each of those were about 9.3 miles long. And a column of smoke was off at the coastline. Fem Ki Tiu, Vice Minister of Transportation, told Reuters that boats had been dispatched to try to determine whether they were connected to the missing plane. So, there were no reports of bad weather prior to the crash and no distress calls or other indications of problems. Okay, so those oil slick sightings, I mean, it's pretty interesting, right? So they got me thinking. So I have this connection back in the Maldives that I thought we could go talk to about the sighting and then it hit me. What better way to hear this story than to get it from him? So you know what that means, guys. It's Montauk time. Is it Montauk time? (laughs) Yes. All right. (laughs) So let's strap in and strap on because we're going to Maldives Island on March 8th, 2014. All right. Everybody's dial set. I am ready. Mine's good. And go. Is everybody okay? Yep, hand's still broken, guys. Didn't get fixed in the time travel. Damn it. You need to go back in time before you broke it and avoid that situation. Tell Bigfoot to take it easy. (laughs) Oh no, he's usually rough. I mean, he's very kind. Oh, very. Mm. Oh gosh, what a gorgeous morning. I've never seen water so clear. You know, Aaron, as we were traveling through time, I was thinking. How did you meet this friend? So, me and him, we go way, way back, okay? He used to be a part of the Brotherhood, if you know what I mean. Uh, which one? Eh, I'll need a drink if we're going to dive into this story, Daniel. Do you think we could find a place this early that's actually open? 
I mean, everything's open on island time. It's like five o'clock everywhere, right? Nah, I mean, yeah, I guess. I mean, right over there, there's a bar on the beach. So uh, let's see what uh, island specials they got going on. Dan, really? You got yours in a coconut? <laughs> yeah, you know, I want to embrace the island life. Plus, holding this big coconut is helping me straighten my hand again, you know? Almost back to normal. It's almost Bigfoot size. <laughs> so when we were going to meet this friend of yours, Aaron, I mean, you never told us the story of how you met. Oh, yes. Thank you, Dan. Uh, you know that I have a bad short-term memory, you asshole. Thanks for mentioning that. Um, so it's about 6.15 right now, and he was supposed to be here at 6, actually. Um, so I guess while we wait, uh, I'll tell you the story. So we met back in Philadelphia. Jesus, what is that? That was a plane white with red stripes. Was that the MH370? Oh my god, it was right on top of us. That was for sure a passenger airline. I have never in my life seen a plane fly that low without a runway under it. What about all those people? We have to tell someone. It has to be landing close to here with as low as that damn thing was. You know, Anna, we can't do that. We must respect history. You can alter the future by one little change. In it. Yeah, it's the damn butterfly effect, Anna. But maybe there are survivors. All right, come on, guys. Look, we have to get out of here. The noise has drawn more people out to see what's, you know, what's going on. And uh, I don't want to stick around, so we need to get going. I mean, true, and th I can't let them see my Bigfoot 2020 shirt. That could just disrupt the balance big time. All right, boys. Let's get home so we can talk about the shit. Guys, that was so that was intense. I thought that thing was going to land right on top of us. Well, not gonna lie. I'm still kind of wondering what happened to your friend there, Aaron. Thought we were gonna meet him or at least hear about him. All right, so I kind of got a little confession here. All right, guys. We're actually gonna meet with him here today, but I thought it would be more fun, you know, of course, for us to go back in time where it all actually happened to get his story firsthand right after it happened. Well, I just checked my phone, and he uh, texted me saying that he was sorry that he couldn't meet up today. But he sent over uh, a newspaper article from that time. So what this article says, and I appreciate him sending it over, so thank you so much for that. It says how people have seen planes fly over this island, but never ever have they seen a big jumbo jet like the one we saw, and never one that low. It also says, we've seen seaplanes, one of those. I could even make out the doors on the plane clearly. It's not just me either. Several other residents have reported seeing the exact same thing. And as we know, some people got out of their houses to see what was causing the tremendous noise too. The residents claim the plane was flying towards the southern tip of the Maldives. Yeah, so that's an interesting article. My whole theory, it, it kind of touches a little bit on that. So I'm going to not really dive too deep into it, but... I mean, we can't talk about searching and sightings without also discussing Brian Allen Gibson. Now, if we had a modern day Indiana Jones, it would totally be this guy. He spent his years traveling to places and learning about history secrets. He has developed a theory on the collapse of the Mayan civilization, went on an overland expedition to Siberia to get the, to the bottom of the mysterious 1908 Tunguska explosion. And he's chased down the lost Ark of the Covenant on the back roads and waterways of Ethiopia. See, this guy's literally freaking Indiana Jones, okay? So here's a link to where we found an interview with Gibson. In this interview, he is asked how long he had been looking for the MH370, in which he replied, I started around March 2015, one year after the disappearance. The official search off the coast of Australia, based on satellite interpretation, found absolutely nothing. So I thought I'd talk to the family members at the one-year commemoration and the people in the Maldives. The officials were spending $100 million that, and hadn't found anything. So I thought maybe I could help solve this 
I've traveled to Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, Malaysia, the Maldives, Cambodia, Mauritius, Reunion, Australia, the US, Madagascar, and Mozambique. Looking for clues. When trying to figure out where to search next, he was told that Madagascar is a magnet. But if debris misses Madagascar to the north or south, it would likely wash ashore in Mozambique. So you bet your ass in February of 2016, he got our boat and he went there. This guy is a real life treasure hunter. This is crazy. So we got a Carmen San Diego here. Uh, <clears throat> he remembered the plane's sightings in Maldives, and this information made him wonder why wasn't it further investigated? He also thought the words of the people were more reliable than satellite signal that was fading in and out. So he took it upon himself and went around and asked local fishermen and residents if they had seen the plane and also asked local fishermen when things wash up on shore, what part of the island is that normally at? After they told him, he went to investigate. Gibson searched the beaches where he referred to what he saw as normal beach junk. Then 15 feet away, a fisherman in a boat raised this gray triangle piece and asked, Is this Malaysia 370? <laughs> is this Malaysia 370? <laughs> Motherfucker, you found it. That's just the <laughs> one piece. It's the whole plane. <laughs> I oh found the plane. God. He walked over and saw it had said the words, No step on it. Gibson knew it was from the plane. No step is written on the plane's tail and wings so that workers don't step on them, and it's distinctive to Boeing aircrafts. Ooh. Interesting. I have a picture here to show you guys. That's the piece that was actually found by that fisherman. So, yeah, we'll link that. Dan will link it up on Facebook, and we'll link it up on our website underneath the MH370 episode, so you can take a look at it there. Um, so, <clears throat> this guy, he took... This piece to, what is that, Maputo? Mm -hmm. He took this piece to Maputo and went. Maputo. It's like you're <laughs> calling me a bitch. <laughs> and went with the Australian consul to turn it into the country's head of civil aviation. It was finally confirmed that the panel was part of the plane about three weeks later. He learned that many other people on the island had found parts and they showed Gibson the parts. In June of 2016, he would go to Madagascar and find many more pieces, believed to be of that of MH370. So does this mean it did crash into the ocean? If so, was it a mechanical issue, a hijacking, or was it something else? I guess, I mean, that rolls us into the question of what could it be? But before we get into theories, let's go over some strange facts and findings. Now, this... First strange fact and finding is I looked into it and I, f I found it a little odd. The plane's official manifest, which all planes have, right, stated that there were 226 passengers on board, which with the crew of 12 that they had on board makes a total of 238, not 239. Mm. What everyone was saying. So was there a mystery passenger on board? Do sky marshals get counted or like have their name listed on the thing? I I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know if I mean, you you have to think a uh, plane's official manifest. It it has to have that. Well, it definitely will feed into some theories that we talk about later, too. Yeah. So that's one strange fact and finding. Who else has another one? I have one here. So the disappearance of MH370 was the deadliest incident involved in a Boeing 777. And it was also the deadliest in Malaysia Airlines history until it was surpassed in both regards by Malaysia Airlines Flight 17, which was shot down while flying over Eastern Europe four months later. Four months later, then MH370 went down. Let me just clarify that. Now put a paperclip in this because we will revisit MH17 later on. Ooh, I can't wait. Another strange factor finding that we have is on flight MH370, there were three Ukrainian ethnic Russians on the plane, which will make more sense as we go into theories here shortly. Just kind of like Anna said, put a paperclip in that. So earlier we were talking about different ways to turn off the transponder and the satellite signal. Well, there's actually a second way to access it. They could have accessed this not from the cockpit 
So maybe the pilots actually didn't know what was going on initially. So this place that you can go, it's by first class bathroom and the galley where they prepare our food. There's a trap door there that they leave unlocked called the electronics and equipment bay. They go in there and they just turn off all the satellite stuff under there and no one would even notice. Let's say the stewardess are giving out food. We're all distracted. We're eating. Joe Schmo gets up to use the bathroom, walks over to that section to stretch his legs, and just pops in and into that little room. And now we have been hijacked. Simple as that. Because all you have to do is even close the curtains to that prep area, because they do have them there. So that guy could have just done that, like one of those real quick and popped in there. And then the stewardess comes back and is like, oh, who shut the curtain? Moves it. And the guy just stays underneath there until the plane either gets to its destination or crashes and they all die. Mm. And that could be the extra passenger as well. Could be. All right. So this last strange fact and finding we have is uh, something I found very odd. So I started digging into the killings uh, of people in Malaysia around this time of MH370. And I found an individual by the name of Zahid Reza. So this Zahid, this guy was an honorary consul of Malaysia and Madagascar. His role was that all wreckage suspected of belonging to MH370 was to be handed to him. Then he would send it back to Malaysia. Now listen to this shit. So in early of August of 2017, Zahid had called and left a message for his friend, Blaine Gibson. Yeah, the guy we talked about earlier, the Indiana Jones dude, right? So Zahid said in the message to Gibson that there were several bits of MH370 wreckage that had been handed in to him and that there was also something rather special that was handed in. And this was in regards to MH370. Before he could give this to Gibson, Zahid was shot dead on August 24th, 2017, in which the Madagascar police described it as a targeted and professional hit. Oh, shit. Damn. I wonder what the hell that was. I guess that rolls us into theories, right? I guess we can theorize a little bit about that and then roll into the other theories we have, but what could Zahid have found that was turned into him? Because he was the con- he was the consul for Madagascar. He was in Madagascar. All the pieces that were found of MH370 were given to him, and he would take it back to Malaysia. What piece could have been turned in where he would have been off? The black box. 